Hi everyone and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. I apologize that we didn't have a study last week. I sort of apologize. I was on a retreat last week with some other ministers and it was really good for my heart and soul. So I won't say I exactly missed teaching last week, but I am glad to be back with you tonight. Listen, you're going to need your Bible and so um, I would like to ask you to go get that right now. We're going to be in 1 Kings 18. Just hit pause because I don't have a TV with me, no props. I just need you to be able to follow along in Scripture as I read through this with you. So if you'll get your Bible, turn to 1 Kings 18. And while you do that, let me go ahead and start talking. Um, my kids are basically grown now, but I, I still cherish the times when I was able to chaperone field trips with them when they were kids. You know, I was a teacher and that was a little bit tricky, but anytime I got to do it, I just loved it. One of the places that it seems like all of the kids ended up going as Cyworks, which maybe several of you have went to. It's, it's a, the same science museum that you probably went to when you were a kid, you know, with the bicycle that powers a fan and a big ball of static electricity that makes your hair stand on end and walk-in models and, and puzzles and TVs with buttons that you can press to watch videos. But I remember taking Alyssa and her friends to Cyworks and one of the best loved exhibits from my small group was about light. And what happened is that we walked into a dark room that had color, this colored screen against the wall and we would stand in silly poses and then the light would flash and a giant cam with like a giant camera flash and our shadows would be burned onto the screen. And the girls would laugh and laugh and we tried so many different poses. We had a blast. I mean, it was so weird to see our shadows frozen in time. Now speaking metaphorically, there are certain moments in history that become frozen too. There, there are moments that flash across the stage of time, but then these shadows are burned in everybody's memories forever. I'm talking about moments like JFK's assassination. For those of you who remember that, I don't, my parents talk about it as if it was yesterday. I remember the Challenger explosion, sixth grade science class. I remember hearing about it. It's like it just froze in my memory. The Twin Towers, the first walk on the moon, you get the point. Sports fans have those kind of images. You know, Babe Ruth calling a shot or Franco Harris catching the immaculate reception. For me, Lorenzo Charles slamming home that dunk in 1983. I, those moments are frozen in time and we'll never forget them. Every time a new year rings in, you know, it, people start to remember the events of the past. We're thankfully coming up on a new year soon and we'll look back and there are certain things that we will remember forever. Now I say that because if the people of Israel had made those kind of lists, then the scene we're going to study today would have absolutely appeared on every one. Because the day that is depicted at the beginning of 1 Kings 18 was a day that changed Israel and Elijah forever. And even though there were no television cameras to capture the power of what happened, no one would ever forget. And in fact, even today, thousands of years later, at the base of Mount Carmel, there is a statue of Elijah waving a sword in the air that is erected to memorialize the awesome scene we're about to read. This is going to be a fun lesson. So, 1 Kings 18. Now try to remember what's happened in the weeks leading up to this, all right? Our hero Elijah burst onto the scene at the beginning of chapter 17. And if you remember, he confronted King Ahab and he said, Ahab, you are an evil king and you've offended God and you've led Israel into the worship of Baal. And as a result of your actions, there is not going to be a single drop of rain that falls on Israel for years until God decides to heal this land. And as soon as that announcement was made, if you remember, God said, good job, Elijah, now get out of here. Go hide yourself by the brook in Cherith. And Elijah lived there for a long time, drinking from the brook and eating food that was beak delivered by ravens. And then the brook dried up. And God sent Elijah to a widow in Zarephath, a lady that God had called to provide him. And last time we talked about his stay with her, how she trusted him and she trusted God and there was, that there would be enough flour and oil for her family. And God blessed her by giving oil in the jar and keeping flour in the bin. And it was awesome. And in fact, we ended by talking about how her son actually died and Elijah pleaded with God until God raised her son from the dead, which was the first time that had ever happened in scripture. 
And through all of this, what God was doing is molding and sharpening and shaping Elijah and preparing him for the moment when he would be called back into the game. And Elijah patiently waited for that call. So as we move into chapter 18, Elijah's phone finally rings. Follow with me, please. 1 Kings 18.1. After a long time, in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on this land. Now, after a long time or after many days could mean anything here. We have no idea. God's been dealing with Elijah on a day-by-day basis, you know, one day at a time. So every day, God's just been taking care of him for that day. But there's at least at this point been three long years of one day at a time. And God comes to Elijah and says, go show yourself to Ahab. Now, remember, earlier God has said, hide yourself. Now God says, show yourself. And then God, God says, there's going to be rain. But then God said, no more rain until I say so. Now he says, I'm going to send rain. And so here comes Elijah, the most wanted man in Israel. And he's walking right up to the palace. And by the way, Ahab isn't in the palace. He's out in the field looking for relief for his livestock that, that need water. These next verses fascinate me because they give a glimpse into what's been happening since Elijah's been gone. Follow with me, verses 2 to 6. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. And Ahab had summoned Obadiah, who was in charge of his palace. Obadiah was a devout believer in the Lord. While Jezebel was killing off the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had taken a hundred prophets and hidden them in two caves, 50 in each, and had supplied them with food and water. Ahab had said to to Obadiah, go through all the land to all the springs and valleys. Maybe we can find some grass to keep the horses and mules alive so we will not have to kill any of our animals. So they divided all the land they were to cover, Ahab going in one direction, Obadiah going in in the other. Now, from these verses, one thing we learn is the severity of the drought is so serious that the king himself is searching for pasture land so he won't have to kill off part of his animals. It's bad. We also learn how intent Ahab was on capturing Elijah. It says here that Ahab had put out an all-points bulletin, which means that he had searched throughout the land of Israel. He had also pressed neighboring kingdoms for Elijah to make sure he wasn't hiding in their borders. He was very serious about capturing and killing Elijah. And by the way, by the way, we also learned that Elijah is not the only one in danger. Jezebel had been hunting down the men of God and slaughtering them. And in fact, Obadiah was responsible for keeping some of them alive. Obadiah, I think this guy's very interesting. He's a loyal follower of follower of the Lord and there's evidence of that in his actions but he's kind of a closet Christian because Ahab and Jezebel have no idea that he follows God now watch how he reacts when he runs into Elijah as Obadiah this is verse 7 as Obadiah was walking along Elijah met him Obadiah recognized him bowed to the ground and said is it really you my Lord Elijah yes he replied Go tell your master, Elijah is here. Now watch Obadiah's response. What have I done wrong, asked Obadiah, that you are handing your servant over to Ahab to be put to death? Now Obadiah knows that Elijah is in big trouble. And he knows that being here right now with him puts him in danger. And here's why, verse 10. He said, as surely as the Lord your God lives, there is not a nation or kingdom where my master has not sent someone to look for you. And whenever a nation or kingdom claims that you're not there, he makes them swear that they could not find you. But now you tell me to go to my master and say, Elijah is here. Verse 12, I don't know where the spirit of the Lord may carry you when I leave you. If I go and tell Ahab and he doesn't find you, he will kill me. Yet I, your servant, have worshiped the Lord since my youth. Haven't you heard, my Lord, what I did while Jezebel was killing the prophets of the Lord? I hid a hundred of the Lord's prophets in two caves, 50 in each, and supplied them with food and water. And now you tell me to go to my master and say, Elijah is here. He will kill me. I mean, Obadiah recognizes Elijah, but he's so nervous being associated with him. All right. And that seems especially odd because this is a guy who has gone out on a limb and killed and hidden all of these prophets. But I think he assumes that Elijah is being miraculously hidden by God. And if Ahab can't find him, then what? 
if I go and get Ahab and you're not here, I'm a dead man. But in verse 15, Elijah said, As the Lord Almighty lives whom I serve, I will surely present myself to Ahab today. And so Obadiah goes to get Ahab. Verse 16, so Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him. And Ahab went to meet Elijah. And when he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? Translation, is that you, you sorry old snake in the grass? Is it you, the one who's brought so much trouble on Israel? And in verse 18, Elijah says, I have not brought trouble for Israel, but you and your father's family have. You've abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the bells. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Now this is a bold moment. I mean, it took all this courage for him just to walk into the scene, but God has prepared him for right now. And Elijah says, don't blame me for what's happened. God brought this drought of judgment because of you. He doesn't back down one inch. And then he offers a plan. He basically orders Ahab the king, assemble all the prophets of Baal and Asherah together. And amazingly, Ahab agrees, probably because it seemed like good sport, and he's the king and he's bored. Notice how many there were, 850 of these guys. And they were so exalted that they ate at Jezebel's table. So the audience that gathered was composed of two groups. There's the prophets and the priest of these false gods. And there are the sons of Israel. In other words, the general public. Because this is a huge sporting event. Nobody could resist coming to this. If this were today, every news agency in the world would be on top of that mountain. And everyone at home would be glued to the TV. And then Elijah addresses the crowd. Verse 21. Elijah went before the people and he said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. See, these people have moved into hardcore idolatry, but they're still split about who to follow. <clears throat> some follow Baal. Some follow Asherah. And of course, there would still be a cultural and a half-hearted tip of the hat to God Almighty. Everyone seems very indecisive and confused. That seems typical to me. As soon as truth disappears, everybody starts to look the same. So Elisha says, how long are you going to go back and forth like this? How long will you be lukewarm? You can't have it both ways. If the Lord is God, follow him. If it's Baal, follow him. Choose a side. It's decision time. But the people don't say a word because they're neutral. They just stay neutral. They're just watching. But Elijah's undeterred. Because he is surrounded by a semi-hostile crowd and 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah. And without question, there were idols erected on the top of this mountain, just like there were on all the other mountains in Israel. But Elijah was not afraid because he had learned now that the battle belongs to the Lord. And besides, he had a plan that was fixing to blow them away. Verse 22, then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets. So get two bulls for us and let them choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I'll prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. And then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord and the God who answers by fire. That is God. See, Baal was supposed to be this great God, this all-controlling God of weather and productivity. And a God like that surely would have lightning in his arsenal of weapons. And so Elijah reasons, if he is who he says he is, then it should be really easy for him to start a fire. And of course, Jehovah can if he wants to also. And so it's like a battle of rival deity. And the crowd roars his approval. They said, in verse 24, what you say is good. And then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, this is 25, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first since there are so many of you. Call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. And so they took the bull given to them and they prepared it. And then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Oh, Baal, answer us, they shouted, but there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. They're crying out, 
but it's silence. Nothing is happening. No lightning, no fire, no stirring of any kind. The silence is deafening. And so they start leaping up and down in a frenzy, crying out, begging, pleading with Baal to answer them. And as this happens, in verse 27, Elijah starts to mock them. He began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a God. Perhaps he's deep in thought or busy traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. I mean, he's just standing there. Elijah's just standing like leaning against a tree, watching these guys jump around like a bunch of wild animals. And he's laughing and he's mocking. Maybe he's eating lunch. Maybe he's taking a nap. Maybe you're not shouting loud enough. You should shout louder. And so they did. Verse 28, they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears as was their custom until their blood flowed. Midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice, but there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. This went on from morning until evening. Can you imagine? They were hoarse. Their bodies were mutilated. They were exhausted. These guys have been living in luxury. They're used to being pampered. Now they are slapped, worn out, flopping down in the dust, bleeding, panting, humiliated. And at that dramatic juncture, in verse 30, Elijah stepped forward. And Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. And they came to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which was in ruins. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two says of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bowl into pieces, laid it on the wood, and then he said to them, Fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said. And they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered. And they did it the third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. Four pitchers of water, barrels of water, lots of water, probably from the Mediterranean Sea. The wood is soaked. The trench is filled with water. Elijah is going to prove a point here. At the time of sacrifice, verse 36, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord. Answer me so that these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. No screaming, no pleading, no frenzied cultic dance. Just a plainly spoken, simple prayer asking God to demonstrate who he is. And the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. And when all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and they cried, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And then Elijah seized the moment for some housekeeping. Elijah commanded them, seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let anyone get away. They seized them, and Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered there. And I know we read that in 2020, and we say that is an extreme response. But let me ask you a question. If a doctor found some malignant cells growing inside of you, would you want him to remove some of the cells or maybe to suggest some minor surgery? You would say, get in there and clean them out. That's just wise. It's not extreme. It's essential. Elijah is fighting for the heart and soul of Israel. And God is doing something great. Folks, when I read the story we're going to read, it just makes my heart thump. And it reminds me that when we are in the will of God, we're invincible. And I don't mean we can't be harmed. I don't mean we can't die on this earth. But what I mean is that nothing can make us more uncertain and insecure than not being sure we're in the will of God. And on the contrast, if God is for us, who can be against us? I mean, what can happen that can make me say I'm in trouble as long as God is for me? And that's why Elijah is not intimidated on that mountain. Eight times in this passage when Elijah spoke, he commanded. He didn't shift or, or suggest or stutter. He wasn't on defense. He was on offense. And that's because he knew where he stood. This moment was not about him. It was about God. 
And the other thing I want you to see in this, in what we just read, is that divided allegiance is as wrong as open idolatry. Elijah confronted the people and said, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? See, they were living, the people were living in this mediocre state of non-commitment. It's a safe place. It's the place that our culture loves because the middle feels easy. But the Bible is pretty clear about the things of God that we have to get off the fence. We're either for God or against him. Remember what Jesus told the church in Laodicea? I hold your lukewarmness against you. I can't stand it. If you've known Christ for a while, but you've never really committed to him, it's time to stop hiding your love for God. Yes, these are difficult times, but God is God, and he can use you and me. Don't stay neutral anymore. One more thing. Our most effective tool is the prayer of faith. Have you ever noticed that many of us have an attitude about prayer that goes, well, if all else fails, I'll pray. And then we feel like we're doing something, so prayer becomes a last resort. Elijah turned to prayer as his first and only resort. His prayer set everything in motion, so I just want to challenge you and me with this question. Are you on your knees right now? On Sunday morning, we are going to have a prayer service here at our church, and it's going to be powerful. And it's not going to be us talking about prayer. It's going to be us praying. I think it's going to be powerful. And I hope that that hour of worship will be a picture of something bigger. A congregation on our knees, a family of God saying the weapon that God has given us is prayer. Because really, this isn't about us. It's about him. And as long as God is moving, and as long as God is active, and as long as God is on the throne... We've got nothing to be concerned about. We just need to be obedient to him. I love the story today. We're going to pick up the second half of this story next week. Those of you who have been in scripture for a while, you know what's coming. So powerful, though. I hope you'll join me next week for this. In the meantime, I hope you'll join us Sunday for this prayer service. Thank you so much for being part of this. It means a lot to me. I love hearing from you after you listen to these. It just, it kind of makes my heart happy. If I can do anything for you, let me know. Hope to see you Sunday.